You're tuned in to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. Powerful ideas to rock your restaurant. Here's your host, Roger Bodwin. Hey guys, it's Roger back at you from the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. What happens when two entrepreneurs get together? They disrupt the old way of doing business and revolutionize an industry. Well, that industry is the drive through as we know it, or as we used to know it. And those two guys are with us today, Mr. Brett Gould and Mr. Kevin Bessie of Hum Dinner. Also with me is my fellow industry pro and friend, Jamie Oichel of RunningRestaurants.com as my co-host. We're going to be talking to Brett and Kevin all about how they've made the drive through suddenly faster and more convenient than ever. You know, this COVID crisis has really turned this industry upside down, and the old norm will never come back again. Now it's all about customer safety and convenience, and we're going to talk all about how this drive through will do just that. It's also going to increase revenues in a single location through those drive throughs as opposed to the expense of opening up another location. We'll talk all about artificial intelligence that they brought to bear on this and the key customer data that you can now mine. Really powerful marketing insights into your customer's behavior. We're going to talk about something they call menutainment that suddenly makes it more fun to order. And ultraviolet light protection. There's the safety part for all contact surfaces. It's ingenious. You're not going to want to miss this episode, so stay tuned. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Restaurant Rockstars podcast, and with me today, my colleague and fellow industry professional, Jamie Oikel. We do a lot of recording together. You'll be seeing uh, more of Jamie in the future on this podcast. Also with us today, our guests, Kevin Bessie and Brett Gould, and they are CEO and founder and CMO and partner of a company called Hum Dinner. We're going to tell you all about that. It's all about contactless, artificial, intelligent-driven, smart drive throughs Really exciting stuff, guys. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thanks for having us. So everyone's heard that expression, necessity is the mother of invention. And that's, that's an old, old cliche expression. But in this case, you saw the need... But it really came out of frustration, um, the, you know, the brainchild for Hum Dinner. So please explain that. Tell us, tell us your story. Sure. Uh, so this was an innovation that I, I had uh, quite some time ago and didn't really start acting on it till you know, a couple months uh, prior to, to COVID. Uh, I had played around just trying to get uh, industry insights and, and see how popular it was. But basically, it was born out of my frustration of waiting in lines. I just absolutely hated waiting in lines. Uh, Grew up in the construction industry, um, you know, going out to the job site. So I felt all the pain of our workers. You know, we get uh, 15 minutes for coffee in the morning or a half an hour uh, for lunch. So time is of the essence. And, uh, uh, you know, with the growing uh, menus and uh, varieties that the uh, restaurants were starting to offer, started clogging up the drive throughs. And uh, not only that, uh, it's just, uh, it never really evolved for 70 years. Uh, restaurants created a second lane uh, to capture more volume, to keep people from driving by and give the illusion that you were going to get your order quicker and and be on your way. And it was just the opposite. And uh, so uh, the lines actually started getting slower. And uh, again, being in the construction industry, I, I uh, took my knowledge of uh, some industrial applications and said, I can make a way to uh, relieve this, uh, get rid of the bottleneck and uh, make uh, multiple points of distribution. Uh, then uh, Brett had saw what I was doing on LinkedIn and reached out to me and said, hey, listen, you know, let's rebrand this. Uh, you know, I see what you've got going on. You're solving an age old problem. Uh, we can just put a little bit of spin on it and I can help complement your system uh, by our AI technology. And then COVID hit us uh, within two months after meeting. And it took us about a, you know, a few weeks to, to all of a sudden sit and realize that we actually had a, a, a real uh, positive solution to the industry to not only increase revenues for a restaurant that's struggling, but to make it safe for not only the, the, the public, but for the employees as well because of the exposure that they would have. So with just some slight modifications and adding some UV lighting and some uh, changing the um, climate control system to uh, create a negative airspace, we were able to come up with a, a way that would not only uh, have multiple lanes and multiple points of distribution, but make it safe for the public. That's a fascinating story. And you, so you guys just both connected on LinkedIn 
months ago. So you saw the opportunity, Brett and or Kevin, and then Brett obviously saw a way to improve the technology. And then the artificial intelligence piece comes in. We're going to get into that uh, in sort of a deep dive. But let's talk a little bit about your backgrounds. I'm fascinated because, uh, Kevin, you've got an MBA and a PhD in business and entrepreneurship. You've spent much of your career in the construction industry. And Brett is a serial entrepreneur from Silicon Valley. I know there's sort of a Steve Jobs connection there, which which fascinates uh, people as well. Um, and then you've got an intelligence company on the side that brought that technology to hum dinner, if I'm getting all this straight. Am I missing yeah. anything? No, you're, oh, right. you're pretty spot on. Okay, that's cool. Well, let's briefly talk about the Steve Jobs connection. Now, you were mentored by Steve Jobs, Brett? Yeah, um, growing up in Silicon Valley, uh, in the, you know, being a child of the late 60s there, I was kind of in the right place at the right time. And my family knew a lot of the the founders of these companies, like Nolan Bushnell, who founded Atari. Mm. We yes. lived just a, a block away from the home where Apple was founded, and I interacted with Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak there. But I also met them at Atari. And uh, ultimately, I was a part of a, a California state educational research program where they had combined all these different districts into a couple of classrooms of grade school kids, like grade third through six. And um, thankfully, the kids didn't know this, but everybody in the classroom had a certain IQ of a, an amount or above. And so they were just doing some experiments. And really, what they were doing was running it like a college. Uh, it was fascinating to be a part of that. And Apple got involved uh, very early um, in the late 70s, long before their IPO. And uh, they wanted to, to bring the computer into the classroom to see if there was anything that could be done to, to actually... Uh, engage with students, but also to be a part of the learning process. We were actually the first classroom in the world to do that. And they were writing some of the original programs uh, from, you know, it was the first Apple computer that was brought in originally, and then the Apple II came in. And they were writing things like Lemonade Stand and the adventure applications, the text-based adventure, and things like that to, to teach us about computers. And I was literally taught how to program by Steve Wozniak. Um, and they divided the classes up into groups of knowledge and skill sets. And I was in this little group of three um, that were, were the creative kids. And Steve Jobs worked with us. And he basically said, you know, we're trying to make a computer that's powerful enough for your parents to be able to use it in their jobs, you know, in their office. And, and that's simple enough that those kindergartners down the hall that don't even know how to read necessarily would be able to use it as well. And he said, you know, we've got some problems like getting people to plug in a disc or, you know, click a key. How do you think we could solve this? And of course, you know, we thought, well, with pictures and we started drawing what became icons. Uh, ultimately, they actually licensed some of them from some of us. And we're talking like $20 for, you know, <laughs> an image that they used millions of times later. But um, it was it was interesting to be a part of that. And uh, they had a, a little contest in the classroom to name the computer, not to name it for Apple, but for the classroom, like you'd name the guinea pig, you know, and they put up a hundred dollar scholarship as the prize for whoever had the best name. And I remember there was a girl in the class who uh, had the name Macintosh. And I, I remember my reaction to that was, oh, her dad thought of that. But uh, <laughs> basically that was the first time that Steve Jobs had ever connected that word. And although the official, the official lore of Apple is very different for, uh, numerous reasons. I, I did see the contract they had her parents sign for the $100 uh, scholarship, but uh, basically Steve wanted to distance himself from that particular child coming up with a name. And so they had a very different story about how it worked later. But uh, ultimately, Steve Jobs uh, called a parent-teacher conference and I thought I was in trouble, uh, <laughs> which wouldn't have been out of the ordinary at the time. And um, he met with my parents and the teacher, and then they brought me in. And essentially, he identified me as being what he believed to be a marketing prodigy and asked permission to stay in touch with me. And that led to about 20 years of uh, mentorship where he and I would just be in touch and we would bounce things off each other. And, and really what came from that, the, the biggest thing that came from that, aside from, you know, wearing a turtleneck sometimes, is... Uh, I noticed that, the that, black turtleneck. It's, it's not, it's a t-shirt. Oh, all right. Well, <laughs> I get the idea. You planted the seed. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, there's an influence, but um, I, I don't try to be Steve. And you know, there's a lot of things that people always talk about with him that that might not be so positive. And and the areas that they focus on are actually a little off base because they think of all the products that he created and how amazing they are. And granted, they are. But his approach to everything was always based on one thing, and that was the customer. It was creating an experience for customers that was beyond anything that they could get anywhere else that would make it so they would clamor for what whatever the product or service was. And I've applied that in every role I've had, <clears throat> every role in my industry. Um, and I started out as a programmer, developer. I was a webmaster, one of the original webmasters actually out there, and uh, kind of avoided my marketing roots as much as possible, but I always ended up doing the marketing side of every website I built and every company I worked for, I ended up helping them with their marketing. And it was always from a standpoint of let, let's see what your customer needs. Let's find a way to thrill them. And so that's the approach I've had in everything I've been doing. Um, and so my role with the intelligence factory, I was a co-founder of a, an artificial intelligence company where we're building uh, applications and solutions for companies. We're helping them with digital transformation, things like that. Uh, it was during that time um, when I discovered what Kevin was doing and immediately recognized what he had was a, a brilliant solution to a, a very old problem that I knew that restaurants had been trying to solve for a long time. And I believed that taking his idea and providing the finesse of finding a way to make it so customers would not lose uh, that close contact with the restaurants and vice versa, even though you'd be automating the drive through there had to be a way to, to maintain that connection. And that's where the intelligence factory uh, came in and where the idea of creating a new menuing system and reinventing the entire process came into play. That is a really fortuitous story and, and really relevant and inspiring as well. So let me ask Kevin, were you actually constructing drive throughs prior to meeting Brett? Or was this just a brainchild that was in the development stages and then you got together and then you combined the you know forces to, to make what's happening now with Hum Dinner reality? Uh, it's a little bit of both. So, so my background, uh, you know, is mainly what they call heavy civil. So infrastructure, roads, bridges, um, you know, finding ease, flows of traffic. Um, you know, I have some engineering background. I worked for an engineering firm in the, uh, in the U.S. when I was younger. Um, I have built, uh, you know, or been part of uh, building Starbucks, Tim Hortons, uh, uh, and other locations. But mainly it's, it's been the larger commercial stuff, the more industrial stuff, water, wastewater treatment plants, uh, you know, retrofitting uh, mm -hmm. pot lines and uh, some of the factories and stuff like General Motors and Reynolds Aluminum, Alcoa Aluminum. But uh, uh, no, it, I was never really in the restaurant business other than wanting to go get my food. And, and like I said, I was just uh, uh, just enamored with having to wait in line. And it just uh, seemed like such a waste of time. Now, you said something earlier that struck a chord with me, and I, I almost got the sense that now COVID is, you know, in full swing, whatever, and people are trying to do the contactless takeout um, curbside pickup model. Restaurants with drive throughs are using that exclusively. Yeah. I'm getting the sense that some of the reason why things had slowed down isn't just the queue in a single drive through It's also because these restaurants were trying to offer either their entire menu or they hadn't dumped things down to make service quick at a drive through as opposed to any other model. Did you find that to be true? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, even, you know, you look at McDonald's, they've streamlined their kitchen in, in some aspects, but they've, yeah. they've drifted away from the aspect of, of, you know, what the original founders had saw and, and you know, how they designed the kitchen. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, their menus were very simple. They, they focused on hamburgers and cheeseburgers and, you know, fish burgers. And uh, they always pre-prepared everything. So, you know, they had an idea of how many customers were coming through at a certain point in time. So they could ramp up their production and make sure that, you know, you know, around noontime, lunch hour is going to rush. And we typically get, you know, 150 customers. So let's start pumping out the hamburgers and cheeseburgers and get them ready to go. But now they have, you know, like they still have to assemble everything. Right. So they have the, the patties that they, they quickly heat and, and, the, and the quick little uh, steamer type ovens and, uh, and then they assemble everything uh, and that really gets away from the you know efficiencies they could go back to their original model um, they could take and uh, you know with the multiple lanes they could divide it up and still have lane number one all your traditional items and everything that's under the sun on the menu 
lane number two, a reject, re, excuse me, a redacted version. So, you know, uh, you know, pre-made sandwiches, uh, donuts, coffee, uh, you know, stuff that's easy. And then lane number three with today's technology, you could have everything that's prepaid and with geolocation, geofencing and stuff, you could always anticipate when that order is coming in and uh, to get that all lined up. So that can be seamless and smooth on that outside lane. I think part of what led to this happening also, because the drive-through times have almost doubled in the last 10 years prior to COVID. Um, the, the restaurants were finding 70 to 75% of their business was coming through the drive-through. So they needed to put as much menu as possible uh, up so that they could sell not only their core products, but also venture into other areas. And now with COVID, you're looking at 95% or more of restaurant sales coming through the drive-through. Um, and the remainder is curbside, which is basically drive-through. And also uh, some delivery, which has been rough because they're paying up to 30% of the ticket. Exactly, so, yep. Um, the the solution has been simply just, okay, it's just going to take longer. And things like McDonald's having two kiosks to order from was simply just a psychological game being played to make you feel like you're not going to wait in as big of a line. But then you get around the corner and you're like, oh, you know, as it narrows you down to one lane again, uh, both lanes, everybody's back in one line. Yeah, let's capture and, the volume. Yeah. Nobody had a solution. Um, I know that Chick-fil-A has experimented with, with a multi-lane system where basically they're almost repurposing a, a dry cleaner uh, loop system where they would have the bags come out to a kiosk, but there was a person in that kiosk and they had to, you know, have an additional set of soda machines and things like that. And there's a cost associated with those things. Having a, another employee when you've got a, a period of time where in some cases like New York city, you've got minimum wage at $15 an hour and it was already becoming unscalable for these, these franchise owners. So, um, Part of the model that I love about Hum Dinner is that it actually makes it easier to have a streamlined kitchen, to have fewer employees potentially. And at the same time now with COVID, it's not only protecting the customers, the guests, but it's protecting the employees because it's, uh, it's sanitizing the carrier tray every time it goes in and out of the restaurant to keep everybody safe. Yeah, because we, we've had real issues with, uh, you know, a lot of the major brands uh, uh, playing on uh, the people's trust and emotions uh, regarding contactless and uh, uh, touchless. And, and when it really isn't, it's, if anything, it's uh, low contact, you know, or because uh, think about your curbside delivery, you know, and what I love is I'm, I'm watching some of these advertisements. I won't say the brand names, but they'll show in their pictures contactless. They'll show a curbside person delivering. They've got their mask on, but they have no gloves. They're touching the container, they're touching people's doors, they're touching the restaurant doors, you know, and even even if they did have gloves on, you have to change or clean those gloves every time, mm -hmm. right? And uh, so that wasn't really a solution. And not only that, uh, you know, um, there's another brand, uh, again, I won't mention names, they've gone through and there was a big QSR uh, article stating, you know, how revolutionizing is this, you know? This company's jumping on the bandwagon. They're going to add another lane for their drive-through. And basically, it's just a person running out to the car. And so that puts that person in exposure and close proximity with, you know, tons of people in a day. And it won't work in the wintertime either, you know, <laughs> in, in, or, or, you know, even that, uh, you know, somebody standing out uh, in Arizona where it's 100 degrees out uh, trying to take people's orders on a, on a mobile platform. And, you know, I realized also very early on when I first met Kevin that this was also potentially an opportunity for restaurants to protect, again, prior to COVID, to protect the employees because currently they have to run out to the, to the people that are in the queues and deliver bags of food or, or right. whatever they're bringing them. And there have been situations where people have gotten injured, whether they've you know had a slip and fall or they've actually been injured by a guest or a car, you know, there's there's a number of liability issues that restaurants have faced with having their employees run in and out of the restaurant and having it so that the restaurant itself is closed off to the outside as a ghost kitchen uh, makes it so no employees are having direct access to anyone on the outside and you're protecting everybody that way. You mentioned, let's talk about the labor piece really quickly, especially with sure. higher wages and trying to limit 
you know, payroll, especially since sales in lots of restaurants are down 50 to 70% still. And, you know, some restaurants are thriving, clearly. A lot of restaurants are still struggling. But let's go back to the labor piece, because my frame of reference, I've obviously been to lots of drive throughs I've not been through a multi-lane drive through but my frame of reference is my bank. Whenever I go to my bank, up until about three weeks ago, you had to go through the drive through You could not go into the lobby. And they got multiple lanes. They got an ATM lane. They got two different teller lanes. But there's literally a dedicated teller for each of those lanes do you not need dedicated people for each of the lanes in the hum dinner system no because uh, here's the thing you know you, you look at the way the orders are taken now they, they come into a central uh, repository a digital screen that goes to the kitchen and mm-hmm. prepares it you know typically now the the the, the drive through you have to have a person doing that right taking that order you know they have the headset on you're trying to understand them they're punching it in and it goes to the kitchen with the ai system and what we're proposing is you don't have to do that. The AI system takes it and it processes the order and it goes directly to the kitchen. So now you've eliminated a person. Now, as far as uh, distribution and, and putting the product out, um, I'm not sure how many drive throughs you've been to and it just depends on the restaurant and the scheme that they have. But we'll say like a local coffee shop that's very popular here in Canada, typically when you get up to the drive through window because they have the double kiosks and they're taking all the orders, the orders are stacked up. And they, they can't, you know, they're, they're ready to go, but, you know, they're stacked up two or three deep. So really, you know, if you have the three windows that are side by side that are close for, for delivery, that person can now take that order. They've got the number on it, goes to lane one, lane two, lane three, and they can put it in and away it goes. And so it's just, again, it's all about efficiency. And so therefore you don't need as many people. You know, we, we've got other models that uh, that's not advertised, you know, for interior, you know, we're, we're reimagining it because uh, obviously it was all designed prior to COVID-19. So we're coming up with a way to uh, implement that. And, and again, it was all about uh, reducing waiting times and reducing staff because like you mentioned, at the cost of labor, it makes it very hard for these businesses to stay profitable. But not only the wage aspect, the other issue is uh, the availability of the resources that want those jobs. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I'm in the construction industry and, you know, like the little province of Ontario, I think it's, uh, they're predicting by 2028, 2030, they're going to have over, you know, 80, 85,000 skilled workers, skilled laborers retiring. They're only anticipating about 35 to 40,000 people replacing them. And that's going to be a huge deficit. And that's just the construction industry. And it's also, when I did my studies and research, it's other industries, the hospitality industry, the uh, medical industry. There's just going to be such a wave of the baby boomer generations as it starts building and growing, retiring, and there's not going to be the people to replace them. And every industry is going to be fighting for those people. You know, um, from the customer side, looking at the drive through as it is today, it is not an enjoyable process. It's been frustrating. If you go up to the, the menu and you try to place an order, everyone's had the thing where you say, yeah, I'll take a hamburger. And they're like, all right, six Cokes, no problem. You know, and there's miscommunication and those people that have disabilities, like uh, if they have a hearing disability, they actually have to bypass the menu and go directly to the payment window and point at a card to order. And it's humiliating for them. They, they don't like that. Um, So part of what we were looking at doing is also as a part of this, not just making it so there's no more interaction with a, a overworked person who's trying to not only take the orders, but also process payments, but, automate those things and do it in a way that engages with customers and makes them feel important. And you're, you're not having to deal with the, uh, a microphone and the audio issues they have. I mean, they, they spent money trying to, to, you know, isolate noises and try and amplify the voices so you could hear better on both sides. And th- the answer is something different. And um, having the menuing system be able to handle not only the, the ordering process and making sure you're getting what you want, but doing it in a way that's actually engaging with you and making you you really enjoy the process. Um, being able to order in your own native language, going up to the board and just starting to speak French or Italian or whatever language you're speaking and have the board res- respond to you in your language as opposed to press one if you want English, press two, you know, that kind of thing. And likewise, having your payment handled in a contactless way and it's your choice. You can do it with your phone. You can do it with holding up your card. There's a number of different options for how that would work. And all of these things would normally be handled by someone who's overworked and really generally not in the best of moods, uh, though some are better than others. We've all experienced the grumpy drive-through person. 
And it's, it's not great for the brand. It's incredibly difficult for the brands to actually be able to, to manage and control the way that interaction works. And having a menuing system which has a personality and has uh, a fun element to it, we're calling it menutainment. It's uh, utilizing animated characters that don't look like people. It's not like, you know, Max Headroom or, or some sort of frightening looking attempt at a human, um, but actually utilizing characters that the brands can associate themselves with and doing it in a way that's whimsical and fun and interacts with people in a, in a human way, not like Siri and, and Alexa, where you've got like three or four canned answers for every question, but actually being able to improvise and being able to play off of your emotions, reading your face and being able to see, hey, this person's not having the best day, let's keep it streamlined, versus this guy is smiling and laughing, so we're going to have you know, a little bit of fun and, and entertain them a little bit more, um, making it so it, it is actually interacting with customers and giving them the experience where they're going to want to use their their phones and and record what's going on to be able to share it with people it's going to be a the the experience will be just as much fun for them as it is that they would go to a restaurant to get the food they're they're going to want to come back to do it again just by making it that engaging and at the same time the restaurants will be capturing data in a way that they've they've been unable to previously because there's an enormous amount of data that is available for them and right now they're so focused on just trying to cut the drive through times down their main focus in every case that i've seen so far has been just stats on what people are ordering how quickly it took to fill it and how quickly they're out the you know the end of the lane and what they're missing out on is the types of things where customers are ordering these types of things at these hours at this location. And you have a certain customer that every Tuesday will come and order this and it requires us to make this fresh. And so you can start anticipating those types of things using machine learning and AI. Uh, these are very reasonable things. And with curbside pickup, when you have someone ordering on an app or on a website, uh, we we have uh, the ability to use geolocation and geofencing. So not only will it tell the person, hey, your your order will be ready, you know, in five minutes or whatever the amount of time it is, depending on the type of order, but also it'll tell the restaurant, okay, they've now left and they're on their way here. They will be here in X number of minutes. And it enables them to have the order hot and ready for them, made fresh for them, as opposed to something where it's like, okay, uh, do we have anything that's already cooked that's sitting on the on a warmer right now. So it will provide for a much higher customer experience, uh, not only with the ordering process, but also with what they end up with at the end, the actual uh, product that they walk home with or, or drive home with. Hey, Raj. Um, yeah, yeah go question, ahead, Jim. I got so many thoughts in my head. Go on. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, there's, there's, a, there's a super super lot here. I, question for you, Raj. Do you, do you ever go out to screen share real quick and you're, I, I know a lot of people listen to an audio, but if we went out to screen share real quick, I'm, I just happen to be on their website and it'd be interesting to hear them walk through uh, what, what I see, the little video on their website and a couple of features. Do you want to, do you want, you want me to, do you want to try to pop out there real quick and they can say, Hey, this is because it's, it's a lot of visual, a lot of visuals to what we've been talking about. And um, that might, 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 might be helpful to do that. But uh, right. as, yeah. as you pull up the website and th just think about that for a second. And I just want to talk conceptually for a second, because traditionally you think about drive through as, as fast food, right? It's that yes. those were, those were the big guys and the big brands and that's, that's where it came from. But now COVID has changed pickup to every single restaurant needs to have a, 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 a pickup strategy, a curbside strategy. Mm -hmm. You can't, um, you can't exist without it. So I, I, I want to come back to my point in a second, but I see, I see the screen share up. One of you gentlemen kind of walk us through what we're seeing here. Oh uh, yeah. So this is just a, you know, a randomized conceptual of what a, you know, at that time when I designed it was fast, casual, uh, quick service restaurant. Um, the applications here are also for uh, retail and grocery because we have units that will carry up to 500 pounds, but that's another story in another program because I know you guys are focused on the restaurant industry. Uh, but uh, so basically, you know, uh, the, the layout and the parking lots can be almost uh, any adaptation uh, that you that you want, uh, you know, lane widths, but, number of lanes um, this here happened to separate it from the building a little bit so it required just a little bit more space but you can have the first lane um, you know right up into the building uh, like a traditional drive-through 
but you would place your order at the kiosk and then you drive up to the uh, corresponding lane. There's a uh, sliding receiving door. Once you've pulled up, there's proximity sensors and everything that can uh, uh, register when you're there. And uh, then the, uh, the door will queue up and uh, there's a, uh, a little tray that will slide out again with proximity sensors uh, where you can uh, grab your food. Uh, if you went a little bit further down on the page, it kind of shows a, a, a cutaway view of what that uh, uh, system looks like. Go back. Uh, am I there? Back up? Yeah, right right it's there. It's a little video on the left there. Oh. So if you, yeah, middle of the page, sorry. Yeah. Oh, you had it. <laughs> yeah. Middle of the page. What am I missing? Oh, right there. Like, oh, this, this, oh, this there goes we back go. to your bank there idea. This is kind of like the bank yeah, teller. That's cool. We put yep, it in. Yep. It transfers over the, 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 the lane and comes back down. That's cool. And, and so forth. So, yeah. This is um, incredible stuff here. Yeah. There's so much to talk about. I mean, this is revolutionary. But I also want to get into the artificial intelligence piece and the data capture and how simple or how complex the data can be because restaurant owners have a thousand details to focus in on but oh, the sure. data and the marketing is such a critical piece so not only do you have to hit them over the head with okay i'm really psyched now that i got my multi-lane drive through and i'm gonna you know give better service and people are going to be entertained by the menutainment features and it's going to be contactless and it's going to be safe and all that and there's more to that piece i want to get into as well but now suddenly you got all the data to digest. First of all, what is a minimum number of, say, weeks or months of data before it's relevant to, you know, the owner operator of a business like this? Is it like six months of data or more or less? Or what would you suggest there? Uh, well, first of all, the, the data side is going to be managed for them. So they're not going to have additional challenges or additional uh, tasks that they have to handle as a part of their role. Um, it would be done as a SaaS model of software as a service. So we would be providing them with the ability to pull reports if they're interested in things. We could point out uh, insights that are, are we are noticing and uh, also be able to train the systems further as you were asking about. Um, on delivery, the system would have a basic training system already in place. So it would already be able to interact with customers, obviously, but also be able to start gathering data. The learning from that data would take potentially a month or so before you'd start seeing any noticeable changes, and it would come in the form of recommendations. But that, that learning process can be very fast because if you've got, you know, let's just say 100 people that go through your drive through every day, that sample set becomes pretty substantial uh, very quickly, and it doesn't take, uh, unlike the way it used to be with machine learning, it doesn't take millions of examples for a system to learn. Um, we've been able to narrow things down so you're getting insights a lot faster. And uh, the Intelligence Factory literally has rocket scientists that are our data scientists. Uh, they've got stuff up in space, and uh, they've, they've created some amazing things in the past. Uh, companies like Smuckers have utilized our team members. And you know this applies in the restaurant industry so well because you're dealing with things like food waste. And if you're able to predict with a higher accuracy level, when you're going to have peaks and when you won't and on which days and you know what types of of things you can anticipate down to a granular level that you know that if you know guest number a or whatever always orders this but when he doesn't order this he orders this and it's different and so you can anticipate those things so you're not always making something expecting one particular guest to show up um there's there's an amazing amount of complexity to what the system's capable of, but from the user standpoint, from the restaurant manager standpoint, it's going to be a dashboard where they're able to monitor stats in real time, be able to get recommendations. Uh, this could be integrated to whatever extreme they're interested in, but essentially at the beginning, it would just be, here's what's going on as a dashboard and uh, point out anything of interest or if there's any sort of problem with, uh, you know, you're running low on this, shall we remove it from the menu? Things like that. Um, and if they are out of something, it would remove it from the menu. Um, there's, there's a bunch of different things that would happen automatically, but the majority of it would enable the management to, to take note of something through a, a dashboard and then respond accordingly. But we're, we're not looking to complicate their job, we're looking to simplify it as much as possible. How much of uh, the personal human touch is still present versus lost with the technology? Well, if you look at drive-through today, the, 
the extent of the personal touch is you have a voice on the other end when you're ordering, then you go to a window and you pay and they, they usually don't say much more than the total and they take your money and say, thanks. Right. Yep. You know, get out of here. And then <laughs> you get to the, the pickup window and usually they're a little bit more pleasant, but they're harried and you know, everything's manic and they're trying to get it out the window to you. And, and as a customer that can be actually distressing um, I've had some some interesting conversations with younger people who are going to be their core customer come the next five, 10 years, and they don't like the process at all. They don't like having to deal with facing a person. This is the, the generation that grew up, you know, with a phone in their hand, and they're not used to that face-to-face unless it's someone they know. And so they're actually interested in something where it's one step removed. They They don't want to be dealing with someone live. They want to be able to order in a way that's that is effective and easy in a way that they're used to with like an app, but um, be able to just get their stuff and go. They don't want to have to deal with that interpersonal contact, which is interesting because you would think it'd be otherwise. Yeah, that but is interesting. The restaurants, on the other hand, want to know enough about their customer to be able to shape their menus and their experience around the customers. And if you're able to gauge the the attitude of your customers. Um, not only at the order window, but even at pickup, and you're able to tell they're they're happy. Look at that, you know, like they're smiling as opposed to you know they're angry and they're they're not happy with the service and they're even maybe saying things, and those things can be picked up on and learned from. So um, that type of experience, you know, that's valuable information for the restaurants and from the customer perspective. If they know they're being heard, if they know that if they say, you know what, this really annoys me that every Wednesday I get here and you guys are out of this, those things can be picked up on and actually acted on very quickly. So. Absolutely. Let's get into the protection side of things because consumer confidence is so important today in any restaurant situation. And I know that there's a technology here using UVC light uh, radiation of some sort. Can you explain all that and how it impacts the, the safety for the consumer and the, and the staff person working in the restaurant? Uh, sure. Uh, the ultraviolet uh, radiation, um, any surface that happens to get touched, whether it's the packaging or, say, the carrier tray, um, the minute the door closes, uh, the UV light comes on uh, and it disinfects any of the surfaces. So we have uh, 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 light coming in uh, in the unit and it basically just the time it takes to travel, uh, it gets disinfected. And once the person receives it, door closes the light comes on again so it's pretty pretty simple that is, not much to it <laughs> yeah yeah i mean but it's the kind of thing that you wouldn't think of unless you actually experienced it and and knew it but i think that's a point of differentiation i think it's something that's relevant to inform and educate the customer about because yeah. lots of people i mean most people are concerned about their safety unlike what you see on the news some days it's like people are really yeah. sort of paranoid so yeah and, and the technology has been around there for for quite some time it, it mm-hmm. changes uh um, organisms on a molecular level yeah uh, so that's what ends up killing it uh you know i was i was um introduced to uv lighting you know, years ago uh, when i worked for a company called stearns and wheeler out of uh, casanova new york uh, they did a lot of um wastewater treatment plants and water treatment plants and they had huge uv banks uh, that were used for disinfecting the water but the water would pass through the uv lighting and then later on it was adopted into other industries such as the medical field for disinfecting tools uh, disinfecting the operating rooms when uh, you know after they, they they did a general cleaning doors would close lights would come on and disinfect the room so and the interesting thing is it's also capable of disinfecting the air Yes. Um, but one of the points that we're making with our system is to make it so it's a negative airspace. So whenever any of the doors open on one side or the other, there's no rush of air coming out from the other side. Because if someone in the restaurant happens to be ill or if someone in a car more likely has some sort of an illness and the door opens and it's blowing air mm-hmm. at you and then yeah. sucking it back in, right. Uh, right. that would potentially cause problems. So we're having a negative airspace where it's actually vacuuming the air out but also the UV lighting will be sanitizing the air as well. God, you thought of everything. <laughs> hey, Rod, can I go a little bit into, yeah, um, yeah wherever you um, want to go, you know, menu and profits and, you know, cause Rod, Rod and I do a lot of, a lot of sessions and a lot of, a lot mm-hmm. of talking and obviously where we are right now for restaurants is like, Hey, uh, let's survive. And, and surviving in the future means being, being profitable. 
and the restaurant industry traditionally exists on low margins, uh, mm -hmm. you know, 3%, 5%, 8%, you know, if you're doing well, you're doing, you're doing 12%. And so, um, we have been focusing uh, some of our content around how to make restaurants more profitable in this environment moving forward. And one of those, of course, has been with maximizing each customer. And it leads me to the conversation in, in, in this case is uh, we want to um, upsell them. We want to cross sell them. We want to bring them back. And, and so it sounds like you've, you've built a lot of that stuff into the system. So take the idea of the average customer, you know, I assume they can order ahead on an app and maybe just they pull up and they, and they just pick up, but right. not let, let's take the, let's take more of the example of someone who is, is pulling up. Uh, they, they're ordering for four, they're ordering for a family of four. And it's, you know, it's not just, it's not just a fast food. It's more like, casual to fine dining. So now we're looking at a, okay. you know, maybe for a ticket of four, it might, it might, might, it might end up being a hundred bucks. How are you strategically thinking about maximizing that, that order? Um, you know, Roger will talk about it. And if, if I was asking him in, in a, in a webinar about this, he would talk about the server having recommendations, having, um, uh, things that they love, you know, promotions, cash cows, all these things. You really have to build that, build that. And so, so anyway, I guess what I'm getting at is talk about building the order, the recommendation systems, um, upselling, how does it work? First of all, the, the system that we're talking about, uh, the menutainment is something that would actually also apply to website ordering as well as app ordering. As long as you've got a camera, it's able to interact with you directly. So this kind of crosses over all of those areas, but let's say in the scenario you've, you've suggested, someone pulls up and they want to order something and pick it up there. Um, that is done on several different levels. First of all, let's say this customer has never been there before at that location. So the system's not going to recognize them. And so they, they pull up to order and they start interacting with the menu. They are able to do it verbally. They're able to do it with, you know, hand motions. I want to see this, you know, have things open up and they can point and things will open up and get bigger. They can say, you know, I'm thinking about uh, seafood. What have you got that's, you know, seafood? And it, it will interact with that. Uh, conversational, very simple. You don't have to say open chicken, you know, <laughs> it's, it has to be usable. It has to be uh, conversational like it would be with a, a server. And so let's say they, they start selecting some menu items and Without knowing this particular guest's preferences, the system will already know that in the past when people have ordered this, they also tend to order these things. Just like, you know, Amazon or Netflix has recommendations. That's very simple for a system to have that. And it's very simple to ingest that information without training um, by the customers themselves, but training from historical data that they, the restaurants would have. So having those recommendations made like, Hey, you know, we noticed you ordered this. Did you know that this wine would go perfect with this? Or you might want to try this appetizer. It's amazing with this. And you're dealing with a character. So it's, it's not just something being presented on a screen or words only, or some voice just saying, you should order this. But instead it's actually a character that's, that's pointing to the stuff and say, have you thought about this? Have you ever tried this before? This is that's amazing. Awesome. You know, and yeah. having that level of communication, that changes everything. And then you have that same customer, let's say they've been there once before, and it'll ask them, do you want me to remember your order, you know, for the next time? And sure, yeah, that'd be great. Um, so they come back and it knows the last time you were here, you ordered this, or maybe you've been there 10 times and you've ordered these things. And it'll make those options available for you very quickly. And you can sort through those things very easily. But it'll also say, you know, did you like this? Last time we had, you tried this, did you like it? Because if you like that, you're going to love this, you know, or even the playful uh, way of presenting a dessert, you know, after, after they've ordered and you want to try and upsell a dessert and it wouldn't be packaging like this, of course, but it could be like, huh? You know, like <laughs> holding up funny. a plate with chocolate cake, you know, <laughs> and just saying, uh -huh, look at that, you know, that's what we're talking about. Um, I, when I first was trying to describe this system, I was saying, imagine if Walt Disney wanted to have a drive through as opposed to a theme park, how would they look at it? How would they engage with people? And that's kind of what we're talking about where wow. it's changing everything. I see this as being a huge kid draw. Like Jamie and I both have kids, you know, and I, I can't speak for Jamie, but I know my kids 
shame, right? The kids would want to go back to a place like this where they actually interact with the thing and the menutainment thing. And it's like, wow, that's a hook. That's a draw. And the yeah. kids often drive where the parents go out to eat, don't they? I mean, that's proven. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, I like what they talked about earlier is, uh, uh, you know, people or, or the kids in this case will actually share the experience of just ordering at, at you know, in, at, a, at a restaurant that has this features. And then that, and then that feeds on itself. Oh, I got to go check it out. And then I got to go check it out. And, and I want to go back and check it out. So, so those, those things, those things uh, feed on itself. And, and I, I wanted to revisit the, the point of, um, you know, traditionally again, drive through and so forth was, was fast food, but now everybody, everybody, everybody in the future has to have a model that uh, takes, takes this into account for various reasons. Uh, hopefully COVID goes away, but it, it may come back, something else may come back. So everybody needs to build uh, curbside and drive through into, the, into their model. That's just right. a fact of the restaurant business and it needs to be done profitably and restaurants are learning how to do that. So, so you know, we're seeing it across the spectrum, even, even fine dining. I think the places that I've ordered from so far have done, they've, they've done it on the fly. So it's been like, make, make signs. I've pulled up into spot number 10. And then when I arrive there, I say I've arrived in spot 10 and then someone does come out to me. So we've talked a little bit about that. I I do wonder in the system, like when we, we went out to visually see your, the drive through and things of that nature, I was thinking of that same process. Okay. I've ordered, uh, I've pulled up in spot 10, but what if I'm in the line and the person behind the food is ready for the person behind me in line? Like what are some of those technical challenges that you've seen that you've tried to answer? And, um, what do you think? Part of it is with geofencing, it'll actually be able to tell when a, a person, a customer, a guest has arrived at the location, and it'll be able to take a look at who's in the lanes right now, and if any lanes are open or whichever one will be open next, it would have them go to that lane. Say, you know, pull up to lane three. Mm-hmm. And uh, those types of things are very easy for a, an AI system to, to disseminate because it will know, you know, lane one is going to take three more minutes, lane two is almost done. Lane three, you know, they just ordered. So, you know, it'll be able to know those types of things. And especially for those curbside pickup experiences, which again, it's really just drive through. But, you know, the the higher scale restaurants are going to have a hard time thinking of it that way at first. It is curbside pickup, but it's contactless. It just so happens that it looks like a drive through, but it's not a drive through. It's not the 1970s. It's not, you know, the 1950s and it's not McDonald's. It's, you know, it's a way for your customers to come through the line and do that high volume table flipping model, but do it without them being in the restaurant. And I believe that the restaurants will actually find this to be a, a beneficial model. Um, nobody's enjoying COVID, obviously, and I'm not suggesting that otherwise. But, um, but I do believe that restaurants, when they embrace this kind of model, they're going to realize that table flipping is best done through the curbside, best done through the drive through get as many customers as you want through there. You can flip tables all day. And then whatever experience takes place inside the restaurant is a, is a higher level of service, is a greater dining experience, and becomes something completely different there, too. Yeah, we I, just, have, I, I, I had one more, I had one more question as it, as, as it related to that, because I was thinking back to the video, and then um, obviously it's a, it's a rendering, but what you see in the rendering is a lot of space, right? There's a big parking yeah. lot. There's three, there's, and a lot. And, and then you think about, well, how much does real estate cost and land and all those, all those things in some places are obviously mm-hmm. self-contained in a strip mall and, and whatnot. So, so talk, talk, talk about that for a second. I mean, some places sure. are just obviously constrained. Is this ideally suited to a location that can be the, that standalone, uh, location? Are there, are there other moderations of it? What, what, what goes on there? Yeah, so there's other moderations. Uh, we've got other models that are designed for, uh, you know, more urban areas. Uh, the rural design you saw there, again, it was meant to be more of an upscale restaurant because you still had interior seating at that time. Um, uh, we do have, uh, uh, I'll call it a hybrid model that, that's similar to, to one that, that was on the website. You saw a three lane that was a, a red and white uh, building. Uh, um, I wish I had the rendering to show you, uh, uh, but we have a, a beautiful model that has a, a well, it's a hybrid. So eventually at some point in time, if they do allow interior seating, you could have interior seating in the building. Uh, but we designed it where you could have the three lanes um, and you can also have a, a, uh, an area for curbside pickup. 
And again, it utilizes the same system uh, where it gets disinfected. And instead of somebody running out to your car, you get up and there's uh, four or five stations, depending on the size of the building and, and what the uh, restaurant want, wants to have, uh, where you can go and pick up your food at those different uh, uh, locations. Uh, the actual cost, um, when you look at the drive through portion, which this was designed originally, again, this was all prior to COVID, was meant for sustainability and profitability. So to uh, look at adding a second and third lane that could potentially double or triple your volume, especially at those high peak times where you get most of your customers, uh, is just immensely uh, profitable uh, in relation to the actual land that it would take to, to uh, put these extra lanes. So you have to think about it. Okay, if I make 75% of my profit, you know, what, is it, what does it look like? What do I have to invest to get that revenue? Well, I have to have a fairly good sized piece of land. I have to have the cost of the infrastructure for the building. I have to have the employees. Now you look at where you can double that by just adding you know, a small uh, investment for one extra lane, uh, the extra real estate, especially when the industry prior to COVID was going to coast kitchen, ghost kitchens and doing um, you know, uh, that type of model, uh, they can take and get the same amount of revenue doubled with the same facility, the same amount of staff with just a little bit more increase in, in, in property acquisition. You know, the average cost, uh, at least here in Canada, to, to, to build out, uh, we'll say like a Tim Hortons or a Starbucks is anywhere from 1.4 to 1.6 million, plus you got the acquisition of the land. You add an extra lane for an extra two hundred fifty thousand, uh, depending on the the, the level of uh, features you want and uh, and architectural finishes. Uh, it's it's not a it's not a big investment compared to what your your uh, profit's going to be on it. Hey, Jay, um, Brett has a, a rendering or an image that he wants to show, but how do I make him a host so that he can share his screen right now? Is that something easy and? Quick, I yeah, can so you should uh, you should have uh, like like if you if you mouse over him, he'll probably have you'll probably have three dots in the corner, and then one of the options. Would be like oh yes, photo. there we go. Thank you. All right, make co-host. There that'll you go, probably, Brett. Want to try no sharing? Problem. That'll probably Thank you for that. Privileges. Yeah, yeah, that that did it. All right, let's see if we can right. bring that up. Here we go. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so this is, is, yeah Kevin, yeah. once you go ahead. Yeah, so this is just uh, again my my rendering of one application and what you need for real estate uh, again configurations you can you can change it up depending on the lot size and and uh, egress uh, but this is the side of the building here that would be opposite of the drive through uh, where you would have sorry uh, where you would have uh, where people can come park where they've already placed their order and pick up or if they find that there is some type of congestion for whatever reason at the drive through or they, they don't want to drive through uh, they can actually go up. There'll be a little ordering station next to the window, which again is all touchless uh, because it uses uh, hand gesture or voice. And, uh, wow, and it cool. could have the same system coming to that side of the building where you can pick it up. And you'd have that UV disinfection as well. Cool. Really cool. And we also have, you know, like I said, this is just for the restaurant. You know, we've got, uh, we've reimagined, uh, you know, for retail space. Uh, there's a something similar that I have. Uh, we don't. I just don't have the drawings ready yet. Uh, that's coming out for courtyard and patio systems. Uh, so you don't have to have a server outside. It'll be the same thing. You'll have stations uh, um, scattered throughout the, the tables. Uh, I've I got we'll, uh, lots I of bottles. Add, of just to add work. to that thinking, I think I think what we saw with COVID is, and I think we, you know we we saw you know, big opportunity to hit the reset button. And in, mm -hmm. in the restaurant industry, I think that's accurate because um, it wasn't necessarily working before for a lot of people. We talked before 80 hours a week, making no money, 80 hours a week, you know, losing money. And some restaurants are wildly profitable, uh, but a lot of them were not. And so how can the industry just totally change, like just totally change how it operates? And, and, and we've tried to talk about that through COVID. And not not having all, all the answers, but we've pro been providing some interviews and, and webinars and, and big events and so forth. But um, it, there does need to be fundamental change like this. I mean, what you just the picture we just saw is very different from things that exist now. And and I think it's it's going to go in that go in that direction. You know, maybe it's like you've already used the phrase ghost kitchen, but that idea where we're just maybe a smaller location producing food 
with the idea that people are, are picking it up, not necessarily dining in. And, and that can be a, 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 a profit maximization technique as long as we're dry, you know, bringing a lot of volume through there. So, so that, 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 that could reset the thing. You know, the big 350 seat uh, venue, maybe that's not where, where the future is. Uh, and so we're seeing a lot of change. And, and Roger, you've been talking to a lot of people. What, what else are you seeing, man? Yeah, I, well, the, the pivoted business model is the wave of the future. Business as usual is no longer business as usual. I mean, this, this is all common sense, of course. But I mean, I see this playing so perfectly into not just the survival thing that we so often talk about, but it's really how are you going to get yourself bulletproof? How are you going to get yourself past the COVID thing so that your business model is stronger, more profitable, more efficient, more customer centric than ever before? And these are the things that we focus on talking about the most. And I think these guys hit it on the head with something that is the key to all of those things. I think that's awesome. It's been a yeah. great conversation. Yeah, everything that I've that I put into the designs, you know, like I said, I started prior to COVID nineteen. So the COVID nineteen came, and you know, I saw the the how this could change and 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 help. But I also mm -hmm. was looking long term, right? What is going to be the future, right? What is the streamline? What is you know the attraction for people, and what is the the, the profitability, and what are some of the, the challenges that we have to face? Whether it's labor, or the wage increases, the you know, what's the way to automate it that makes it interactive, uh, you know. I can't wait for you guys to see some of the other models that we have, you know, cause you, you mentioned, you know, the larger venues sitting yeah. down, you know, eventually people are going to want to get back to some kind of normal and whether there's a vaccine that comes two or three years from now or another virus that comes, what can be built and designed in a way that can take that impact and or survive past it in a way that's, that's interactive and fun. So, uh, you know, keep your eyes out. We've got some, some really good stuff in the works in regards for a restaurant for larger venues that will probably really change uh, you know, the way you think and the way you would experience uh, going out for a meal. And and uh, it's not going to be just a, a question of automation. I think you guys will be quite uh, surprised. And as you awesome. Go also, ahead, Brett. Yeah, it's, as you suggested, um, restaurants do need to be ready, you know, whether COVID goes away or not. Um, some, some restaurant owners believe that it's just going to be a short-term thing. Um, there's also those that understand what, you know, the CDC and other groups are saying that it's not. Regardless of how long COVID lasts, this, this won't be the first time this happens. It'll likely happen again. And those restaurants that are not prepared for it the next time are not going to have the same level of patience and understanding from their own guests as the current time is. So people are not going to be as, as uh, accepting of those restaurants that aren't ready mm -hmm. should something come again. So this is the time for restaurants to, to look for that change. And you know, I'm not, again, I'm not saying COVID's a, a beneficial thing in any way, shape or form, but it does give all restaurants the opportunity to, to kind of hit that reset button, like you said, and see what things work, see what things didn't. And personally, I think, you know, if they do that high volume through a drive through and focus on providing a much higher level of service for any interior dining, you know, a lot of people, if you ask them for their honest opinion on the current state of restaurants prior to COVID, they tell you most of them are loud and crowded and not very fun. And, you know, everybody's overworked and it's, it's not a fun experience when, when you're kind of stuffed into a, a sardine can full of people and you can't hear people at your own table because everybody else is so loud. You know, with the changes that come with COVID, um, restaurants have this opportunity to, to look at their interiors as well and come up with new ways of doing things. We have solutions for that too, but um, we're trying to focus on the, the more pressing needs right now. But this is an opportunity for restaurants to, to reimagine their interiors and reimagine how customer and guest services actually work and provide a level of experience that customers haven't had in many, many years. Yeah. yeah, I mean, cool. people are going to want to have a sense of normalcy and be able to get out. You know, you're never going to stop the, the person that, you know, even if you're traveling somewhere, you're going to want to stop somewhere and, and get something to eat. You know, you want to have that convenience. You want to have that uh, trust uh, to a place that you're going to go. So, I mean, you know, the, the owners have to look at that. They're going to they're going to look that people need the service, but they need to have that trust and uh, relaxation and feel comfortable to where it is that they're going. Right. Well, this has been really a rebirth. I mean, as bad as this crisis has been, you know, you can say that opportunity has come from calamity. And those that are forward thinking and visionary and resourceful and creative and really dig deep, not throw in the towel can really 
take this as an opportunity to, like we say, improve their business. So I really appreciate, Jamie and I both appreciate you guys taking the time to share Hum Dinner with us. Uh, the website, of course, is www.humdinner.com. And that was the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. We will see you in the next episode. Thanks for listening. Thanks again, guys, for tuning in. That was an amazing episode, and we learned so much from Brett and Kevin. You know, it's all about being resourceful, being creative, turning the old way of doing business into some new opportunity. And I think we can all learn a lot of lessons from this particular episode. You know, work on your business now so you decide how or if you even work in it in the future. It's not just about survival. It's about true success in the future. Really appreciate you listening. By the way, we have a new Facebook group called Restaurant Rockstars Official. It's a new forum where we can share ideas and best practices. So I encourage you to check that out at Facebook. Once again, if you enjoy what you're hearing, please leave us a review on iTunes. And if you have any ideas for a special guest that you'd like me to contact to appear on the podcast or a topic that you think would really help your business, please reach out to me, Roger. R-O-G-E-R at restaurantrockstars.com, and we will see you in the next episode. Thanks for listening to the the Restaurant Restaurant Rockstars Rockstars Podcast. Podcast. For lots of great resources, head over to restaurantrockstars.com. See you next time.